Hi folks, Josh Wolf with Wolf Vintage Watches here. Welcome to my shop. Today on the bench, I have a Hamilton Thin Line from the 1960s. Let's get into it. The Thin Line I'll be working on in this video comes with a caliber 688. It is a 17 joule manual line movement based on the ETA 2391. Let's get to disassembling this guy. I'll start by removing the bracelet, exposing quite a bit of dirt and grime. This is a monocoque case, meaning it is one solid piece of stainless steel. To remove the crystal, I use a tool officially called a crystal lift, but I refer to it as the claw in my head every time I use it. The silver arms of the claw squeeze the acrylic crystal uniformly across the circumference so I can lift it out of the case. Hey, it just occurred to me that that's probably why they call it a crystal lift. Huh. Another peculiarity of a monocoque case is the need to use a two-piece stem. You can see the male crown post here. Here I'm loosening the dial feet screws to remove the dial. Alright, let's get cranking on the dial side of this movement, starting with the hour wheel. The minute work cock is next, which exposes the minute wheel and the canyon pinion with driving wheel. The setting lever spring is removed by taking this screw out. Using a plastic pick to keep the components from disappearing, I can now remove the yoke and the yoke spring. Now I'll loosen the setting lever so I can take the female half of the split stem out. Come here, you. The winding pinion and clutch wheel complete the keyless works disassembly. Okie doke, time to flip the movement over and get busy on the watchmaker side. Before I do anything, I'll let any remaining power out of the mainspring by moving the click out of the way and letting the screwdriver slip through my fingers. Then I can remove the ratchet wheel and the click and click spring underneath it. Righty Lucy to remove the crown wheel screw and crown wheel. It's also important to grab the crown wheel ring now, otherwise I'll be digging it out from the bottom of the cleaning solution later. Now I can loosen and remove all of the movement screws and pry the barrel bridge up with a screwdriver. Ah, the setting lever screw. How could I ever forget about you? The train wheel bridge removed exposes the train of wheels. The sweep second wheel comes out, followed by the third wheel. The barrel is removed, as is the intermediate wheel, and finally the escape wheel. With the balance cock still firmly in place, I'll open the balance jewel shock so I can get at the balance jewel in setting. I'll clean these two parts in one dip separately from the rest of the components. I'll close up the shock here to prevent any damage. I can take off the balance cock and balance wheel. This assembly too will be cleaned in one dip. And now for the pallet cock, followed finally by the pallet fork. I'm tightening up the dial feet screws again so they don't shake loose in the ultrasonic machine during the cleaning process. To remove the mainspring, I'll press the arbor against the steel plate to pop off the barrel cap. I can then work the barrel arbor free from the mainspring. The mainspring stores quite a bit of energy, so I take care to walk it free from the barrel with my thumbs. Here are the balance assembly, jewel, and setting in their one-dip bath. Before tossing the case into its ultrasonic cleaning bath, I scrape away as much of the accumulated arm cheese as I can. No sense in dirtying up the water more than necessary. Split stems are a pain to source and can be expensive if they can even be found, so I'm really hoping I can save this one. I'll start by scraping away as much of the rest as I can with a fiberglass scratch brush. Then I'll toss it into some rust remover to really get into the nooks and crannies. As I add all the individual components to their respective cleaning baskets, I give them a close inspection. Removing hair that's wound around pivots, scraping away dried lubricants, and generally looking for damage at this point makes reassembly go a little more smoothly later on. Try as I might, I just couldn't find this model in any of the vintage Hamilton dealer's catalogs. This is not as uncommon as you might think. 
With European-only releases, masterpiece models from Hamilton's awards division, and a less than rigorous approach to documentation in the past, finding one of these mystery models happens from time to time. All that said, the case and dial design and the 688 caliber movement lead me to believe that this watch is part of the Thin Line series of Hamilton watches. For this watch, I've decided that I'll relume the hands. First, I'll scrape out the existing material. Since it's old, it's brittle and flakes off easily. Reassembly time. I like to start with rewinding the mainspring since this is my least favorite part of overhauling a watch. I'm not sure why, it's not particularly difficult, it's just not something I look forward to doing. But it is 100% necessary, so I'll wind the cleaned and lubricated mainspring up using my vintage winders. The mainspring is now ready for insertion into the barrel. I press the winding handle firmly into the barrel, then press the plunger. This will push the wound mainspring satisfyingly and thankfully into the barrel. A little oil on the arbor before I wiggle it home. More oil on the top of the arbor and now I can refit the barrel cap. I squeeze the cap home with tweezers. Okay, now I can move on to the good stuff. Oh, not so fast. I need to remove and clean the jewels and settings in the main plate first. Since I leave them in place when I run the main plate through the ultrasonic machine, these jewels are usually very clean. However, if for some reason they are not clean, I like to take care of them now rather than wait until the movement is reassembled and running poorly to clean them manually. Just like the top balance jewel, these will be cleaned in one dip and then closely inspected for any trace of schmutz. <coughs> Alright, for real this time, fun reassembly is at hand now. I'll lubricate the barrel hole now, lest I forget later. The first component of the train of wheels is the intermediate wheel, then the barrel, the escape wheel, and then the third wheel. I can lubricate the sweep second wheel now. and slide it back into the tube. Ha! I got you this time, setting lever screw. The train wheel bridge can now be reinstalled. There are four pivots that need to be lined up, along with a couple of alignment pins on the bottom of the bridge before I can safely screw it down. I test for free movement when I think I have everything aligned, just to make sure I won't have to scrap this footage, find a donor part, clean it, and install it. Now for the barrel bridge. Since there are no train wheel pivots to line up, this guy goes in with little fanfare. More testing for free movement there. With all the movement screws tightened down, I'll lubricate the top barrel arbor hole and install the click and the click spring. I like this design of click and click spring since it's not under load when it's refitted. The ratchet wheel can now be put back into place. The crown wheel ring is installed to center the crown wheel and provide the right amount of clearance when the screw is tightened down. The plastic pick holds everything steady so I can fully tighten the ratchet wheel screw. Wrapping up the escapement, the pallet fork is refitted. This component is what makes the ticking noise we all know and love as it stops and releases power between the balance wheel and the escape wheel. The pallet cock holds the top of the pallet fork perfectly perpendicular to the main plate. This allows the pallet fork to swing on the same plane as both the escape wheel and the impulse jewel on the balance wheel. I'll lubricate the exit stone of the pallet fork with a special lubricant that stays in place, a critical property being so close to the hairspring. Speaking of the hairspring, let's get the balance assembly installed now. The balance wheel has an impulse jewel on the bottom that interacts with the pallet fork arm. When the impulse jewel on the balance swings into and moves the arm of the pallet fork, one of the pallet fork jewels releases the escape wheel by one tooth. Tick. 
Power from the train of wheels is then transferred through the pallet fork into the balance wheel, giving it a little shove to keep it swinging. As the hairspring coils up, the balance wheel is sent back in the other direction, causing the impulse jewel to hit the pallet fork again, tick, starting the whole process over again. For this movement, the process happens 18,000 times per hour. I can now get the balance jewel lubricated and installed back into the watch. Once the jewels are in place, the pivots are perfectly aligned and the balance moves as it should. These jewels are synthetic rubies and drastically reduce the friction the pivots have to contend with as they're rotating. With the watch now running, I'll lubricate the rest of the training wheels, both on the watchmaker side and on the dial side. The keyless works refers to the parts that wind the watch. The first of these parts to go in is the setting lever. The setting lever moves the yoke back and forth between the winding and time setting modes, and it also holds the stem into the watch. The winding pinion and clutch wheel are lubricated, again to prevent wear and tear. The winding pinion engages with the crown wheel to wind the watch, whereas the clutch wheel will engage with the setting wheel to set the time. Some grease for the female half of the split stem. You can see the rust cleaned up okay. The black color is inert and won't continue to spread. While it might not be super shiny and bright, the fitment between the two halves of the stem is excellent, thankfully, and will work as it should. Grease for the yoke post and for the clutch wheel. The yoke moves with the clutch wheel to engage with the setting wheel to set the time, or to engage the winding pinion to wind the watch. The yoke spring keeps the clutch pressed firmly into the winding pinion when setting the time. The setting lever spring here keeps all the other parts in place as well as creates the two indices or positions of the crown. The two grooves I'm greasing up now are where the setting lever will stop creating the two crown positions. I'll lubricate the canyon pinion with driving wheel now. The friction fit between these two parts are what allow the watch to keep running while setting the time. The brass driving wheel is only moved by the gear on the third wheel. In timekeeping mode, the driving wheel is driving the canyon pinion, which is rotating the minute wheel, which is rotating the hour wheel. When setting the time, power comes from your hand through the clutch wheel to the setting wheel to the minute wheel, and then to the canyon pinion and the hour wheel. Because of the friction fit with the driving wheel, the time can be set without jamming up the training wheels. Preparing to install the dial, I loosen the dial feet screws. The last part to go onto the movement is the hour wheel. Lining up the dial, the dial feet fit snugly into their holes, so now I can tighten the screws to secure it into place. A light cleaning of this excellent dial. Alright, time for a reloom. Using a balance tack to hold the hour and minute hand upside down, I apply a lacquer that I've mixed with a luminescent powder. The surface tension of the lacquer pulls the mixture across the gap in the hands. I decided not to add any tint to this loom because I think a bright white will look the business against this dial. If you'd like to see what adding tint to loom is like, I've put a link in the upper right corner to my service of a 1931 cushion. I think I could save this crystal. I'll deal with the deep scratches with sandpaper first. Once I have a nice and cloudy finish across the whole crystal, I'll bust out a fine automotive grade plastic polish. A bottle of this stuff is as good or better than Polywatch and has lasted me hundreds of crystals at a fraction of the price. Boom, nice. To shine up the case, I'll use a dab or two of semi-chrome polishing paste. This stuff is great. Now that the watch has been running for a bit, I'll give it an initial regulation to see what's what. I need to adjust the beat error first. Basically, the time between the ticks and the talks needs to be equal. Moving this arm on the regulator adjusts the timing of when the impulse jewel on the balance strikes the pallet fork. This arm of the regulator is to adjust the timekeeping. A shorter hairspring means the watch will run faster. A longer hairspring will slow the watch down. After a little back and forth, I'm real happy with a plus 5 seconds per day on the time grapher. This will settle down after running the watch for a few days. Let's get this baby cased up. You can see why a monocoque case must have a split stem here. I'll slide the female half of the stem through the case tube, which also aligns the dial to the case. Then I can line up the male half of the stem and press it home. Since there is no date complication to worry about, I can throw the hour hand on in any orientation and then line it up with the 12 o'clock marker. I do, however, have to line the minute hand up exactly with the hour hand. 
This is easiest if I just align both hands to the 12 o'clock. Both hands are pressed home with a handheld hand press. That's three hands in one sentence. Nice. The sweep seconds hand is refitted. Reinstalling the acrylic crystal is basically the opposite from removing it. I use this jig to hold the crystal steady and align the arms of the claw further up the edge of the crystal. When I tighten the claw up, it compresses the crystal so it'll fit into the case. A couple of puffs to get any errant fuzzies out of there, and I can press the crystal home. Loosening the claw, the crystal expands, pushing against the case. To see other service and restoration videos, click this playlist. Or head on down a YouTube rabbit hole by clicking on this video. Either way, please consider subscribing and liking this video if you found it informative or entertaining. Be sure to leave your comments and questions below and I'll do my best to respond. As always, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Bye.